Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> the divine and felonious nature of cybersecurity. Except, this is my uh, sixth, is this seven? James seven? So this is my sixth, and this one, which I couldn't, this is my favorite, you know, I say this every way, but this one's true. Um, this is my favorite DevOps state, it really is. And mainly because of these three guys. So if you look there, 2012, at 11.10, 11.40, there was a presentation by Ernest Mule, James Wicked, and, and the thing that, I, you know, I'm stealing my own time because I really need 50 minutes, and I'm gonna do it down to 40, but, um, you know, the organizers of, I've, I've done a lot of organizing DevOps days, and it's just a tremendous amount of work. And this is the only sustainable, from the beginning, one that has run every year. And it's because of those three, I mean, a lot of people that help, but James, Ernest, and Karthik, I mean, you, you, know, you need to really give them applause. Because they do this every year. You know, I've been involved in Silicon Valley in New York, and you know, new organizers come in and go, it dies. The reason this city has had the, this beautiful gift of seven years of this amazing event in really pretty awesome city, except when there's tornadoes, um, the, um, is really these guys. You know, I mean, you really need to give it up to those guys if you don't realize. So. Um, I, I've done a lot of shit, right? And this is like 10 years ago, and I wouldn't bore you with the other shit I did, you know, 20 years before that. And, you know, um, I, when you get to my age, you're round, um, you're round down. You know, when you got 12 years experience, you say you have 15. When you have like 38, you say 35. So, um, I've done a lot of shit. I was early in at Chef. I, um, I've had 10 startups in my career. Um, like, seven of them were crash, and well, six of them were crash and burn, like life stories. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, my first one, I was, I was really cursed because my first startup was a huge success. I couldn't quit work. But at 25, I'm like burning money like there's no, mar you know, a Corvette and everything, thinking this is the rest of my life. And the next six, next 25 years of my life are these miserable meltdown, horrible stories of startup failures. Um, and then I'm still waiting on you, chef guys, kind of bring me through. But my last two startups were very nice. One, we sold the company to Dell. And then about a little over three years ago, I did this crazy idea of putting SDN on Docker, and we sold it to Docker. And I left Docker. Um, about six months ago, and I do a lot of stuff on the right-hand side. I'm, I was, I'm the core organizer of DevOps Days. I was the person, me and Damon Edwards from Rundeck, we brought the first DevOps Days to US. I was at the first one in Ghent. Lots of good stuff. And I actually work with SJ Technology, and all my presentations are in my Bachelorloop uh, GitHub account project, my presentations. Um, I'm actually author of 10 books, so, you know, I'm, so I'm gonna stop bragging after this slide, I think. I think this is the, the last bragging slide. Um, I'm author of DevOps Handbook. Um, Incredibly uh, thankful being part of that. You know, Gene has let me for the last almost 10 years ride his coattails. It's been a fantastic relationship. Um, and then we did this amazing project. It's it's an Audible only. It's called Beyond the Phoenix Project. It's very dense, and if you don't want to feel compelled to have to read 30 books after you do this one, do not use one credit on Audible to get it. <laughs> but it's and we cover uh, very in-depth stuff. So I'm, I it's. It's probably a top five project that I did in my whole career. Um, so um, the, I'm going to end with the why I called the title of this presentation the, Feloni the divine and felonious nature. But so now I'm just going to focus on the felonious nature of cybersecurity. This is a little bit old, but I think it starts the picture of um, the uh, Verizon DBR report um, 2015. They had this little shocking sentence in it where it said, um, 10 CVEs, the, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology um, recognized vulnerabilities, accounted for 97% of the exploits in 2014. But the real kicker is the sentence a little bit deeper, or actually Josh Corman is the guy who told me, John, really look at that graph, and if you notice, if you count them up, eight of them were over 10 years old. What's interesting is when Josh sent me the, um, this report and he pointed out you must read this and this is important, um, I was watching 60 Minutes and they were talking about these algorithmic Chinese hackers and all this sophisticated stuff. And I'm thinking, well, those guys are not using the 10-year-old you know, CVEs that are out there because they're just kids doing it. And like, we got it kind of wrong. And you know, um, I'm not going to steal my time. I will tell you, go watch Derek Week, any of Derek Week's and Sonatize presentations. I missed if he did one yesterday. Um, the supply chain report is brilliant. 
Um, they really have done a lot of legwork on studying like what people are doing. Um, Sonotype owns Maven Central, so they get this incredible view. The data's off the chart. Um, I will just compel you, I'll just tell you, it will scare the shit out of you. And, um, and then, uh, you know, like, I'm going to skip the numbers because I just go download the thing. And then they also did something, too. Um, uh, it was a, a community survey on DevSecOps. And the only thing I'll point out, and again, I think you should download that, too. Um, we're getting people to talk about security uh, in anger now, um, which is really good. And not in a way that's like the RSA boots and, like, these gazillion-dollar machines that protect the fort. Um, it's in a way that we're, like, being honest about how shitty we are. For those of you who don't know me, I do curse periodically. Um, I try these days to cut it down. Uh, so my kids now attend my presentation, so I gotta be a little more careful. Um, look at this, 31% of people are at least acknowledging that, um, that there are some adversaries mucking around in their environment. Um, so all right, so um, you, know, you always had to have the Phoenix Project in a DevOps presentation, like the, it was, an obligation that you had to have a picture of the Phoenix Project. So the new obligation in DevSecOps is you have to have a reference to Equifax. So let's get that out of the way. Um, and, and I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you a story, a, a tale of two cities. Um, you know, I'm a great believer or a student of guys like J.P. J. Paul or John Ospar about, like, you can't count on factual things. You can't go back in time and say, should have been this, should have been that. So don't perceive that I'm saying that Equifax should have done this, Equifax should have done that. I just wanted to show something about the felonious nature of cybersecurity. So the, um, the Equifax breach was basically a parsing module called your Carter in uh, Struts 2. It was discovered, give or take, 3.6. I found the record on the Red Hat. I didn't want to listen to anybody else, so I actually wanted to kind of figure this out on my own. There's a billion articles about the analogy of this kill chain. But, um, but I wanted to figure it out for myself to, like, just know. And I found like a Red Hat record where they like they discovered it and they just wanted to get out all to the product owners. They, in truth, no disrespect to anybody, Red Hat, they didn't really care whether you knew. <laughs> they wanted to fix their shit real quick. Um, but it was officially announced on the 9th. But here's where it gets, and then CVA was created on the 10th. And you know, from what you see from the external, I didn't do a postmortem at, at Equifax. I do know some people who done did it. They don't tell me a whole lot, which is good. Um, but um, they supposedly discovered it on 720. This is public. And they announced it on, um, that should have been 17, the picture cut over there, but in September. And it was a command injection. Basically, if you basically did like a curl and you hit, you know, and you said command equals or whatever, um, and it was an authorized machine, like you, you had them. So I got to meet um, this uh, Sutra Elango at Fannie Mae who runs AppSec. And here's an interesting story, right? So she was a developer that was kind of forced to manage an AppSec team. So if you know anything about the DevOps history, there's, there's an interesting thread there. And the first thing she did when she started dealing with AppSec was she realized developers didn't know anything about security. So she just created it, and she's got some presentations. In RSA, we read at DevSecOps days, there's a video of her presentation. You should certainly watch it. She talks about how she does the whole supply chain as a security overlay. But here's how they react. And here's the thing. I do a lot of presentations about this concept of a true north. I'm a, geek of, I'm a geek of Deming, I'm a geek of Toyota production systems. And these companies that I look at that have true norths, like where they, they say what they do, everybody there knows that the true north is there, this is a rare form, and they actually behave according to that. Now, Toyota had it. Um, there are other companies that actually, I, I've done other presentations where I do it. The thing about, um, I got to see an executive um, panel at Fannie Mae and they talk about their true north, about where the people to put people in houses. Like where the trusted people, loans, right, Fannie Mae. And, um, and so here's how they reacted to the struts too. Risk basically notified her team and her CISO on the 9th. They put a war room together that night. Um, they decided to create a POC, which is interesting. That's very agile. And, and, um, and here's the thing, the C-level team with thinking about their true north. I've talked to them about this. And the idea that if like 15 million loan applications went out in the wild, in other words, they took this as serious as serious can be. And because this thing was embedded in things like WebSphere and you know, not everybody has completely pipelined all their service lanes, 
she sat down with her team and wrote a very simple POC, but it took over pretty much the weekend to just basically do that curl injection on every URI and basically every URL interface, external and internal companies. Came up with a target system of ones that could be breached, replaced the Jakarta method. They had full remediation in two days. It's a tale of two cities. And by the way, they both had Palo, and I'm just going to use Palo Alto as the, the punching bag, because I really mean everything else that you spend 10 million, 30 million, 50 million, 100 million on every year that supposedly protects your fort. Um, they all had that. It did nothing to stop this problem. So like um, uh, from the soda type supply report, um, here's a kicker, right? So Equifax makes the you know, front page of the Wall Street Journal, um, CNN. And um, as the fall of um, 2017, it's still 46, almost 50,000 organizations still running that realm of 50,000 organizations are still, what are they doing? Are they not scanning? I don't know. But like, so don't give me this crap about some, you know, TensorFlow deep learning algorithm that figures out how to stop these genius um, from China to get in our systems. Like if you're in the military and this, uh, this uh, stuff like that, have a party. But the, the really dangerous bad guys don't give a shit about any of that stuff. We'll talk more about that. So and then, like, so as we got it right, right? So early this year in February, another bomb drops. And so, you know, this is one where, like, okay, this doesn't make sense, but, like, a lot of things in the world don't make sense, so I just give. Um, it was published in 920. So this is a vulnerability in spring. Now we're talking big game hunting in spring. It's the same. It's not a stretch, too, but it's the same. It's a command injection problem. It's discovered in uh, September. CVA is created first, and even Pivotal doesn't start talking about it. And, I'm getting, again, I'm not punching bag anybody. This shit is hard. Um, but the reality check is that we're just not doing, a, you know, fool me once, right? We're just not, like, stop thinking we're doing a good job in security. Because we're not. And we got it wrong. And that's how I kind of, and then even after that, Sonatype report said almost 367, um, that, that, that vulnerability from spring was downloaded almost 400, let's say 400,000 times in fa five months after the known discovery. This is the reality. You know, James Wickett has this, like, I'm re-quoting a lot of things with James, but one is, you know, he said, it, like, like, you know, like a year ago, two years ago, like half the vendors on the RSA floor won't be there in a couple years. Right? Because they're basically, I hope I'm not getting you in trouble, but um, they're, you know, because, like, the, the paradigm, is, like, is changed. And so um, Martin Casado is mostly attributed as the, um, the inventor of um, SDN. A company called Nasira. They sold the VMware. After the VMware, he started talking about like how we got it really wrong in uh, security. And he's a brilliant guy. Um, in fact, the only reason he created Nasira is because uh, DoD gave him like this impossible the, uh, the Kobayashi Maru problem, <laughs> and he couldn't solve it. But out of the output of that, he realized there's this thing that he can create called SDN. And um, anyway, so when he got there, he ran all network for um, for VMware. And I mean, it was a few years of VMware. He started talking about like. We got this all wrong. We spent 80% on perimeter security, 20% on inner perimeter. Um, we, we're doing it wrong. And, and his version was, I'm going to say there's this thing called a Goldilocks zone. Of course, he's wearing a VMware. It's the hypervisor. This is good. I mean, I know, you know, a little better, right? Like, uh, so stop thinking about the perimeter. Like, like, and his version was NSX, the SDN thing, where if we can arbitrate security from endpoint VM to hypervisor, Goldilocks, that's the place we should put most of our attention. So as I was thinking about this, I'm like, thanks, Martin, because um, the real Goldilocks zone, and I'll talk about this later, is in the pipeline. Like, <laughs> that's the Goldilocks zone for security. We got to get our hygiene from the story to the, um, the, the security plugin in the IDE. To the, and and I'll, I'll go in this a little deeper too. So if you're looking for Goldilocks zone, it's the pipeline. There, thus, we have DevSecOps. So this is the fastest DevOps presentation in the history of mankind. Because there's only three principles I want you to take away, and of course, most of you either know it. If you don't know it, you should learn it from somebody else about DevOps. Vernon Wong was in 2006, prior to the CPO of Amazon, prior to um, even the DevOps kind of being coined, he had this thing called you build it, you run it. 
But it became a manifesto for DevOps, right? Like developers, wear pagers, I mean, all this, right? Like, it was that we needed to get developers to completely own the service, and we couldn't throw shit over the wall. Like, we had the operations and QA had to build the stuff, the meta, the policy, the automation, all the stuff, into the things that developers naturally do to produce services. Now, it could be service team, developer, whatever. But that was what he was saying. But he wasn't saying that, there was, he wasn't saying no ops or anything like that. He was just saying that, like, if you're a developer, you own a service, there are a team of people that have to build this structure, a pipeline, that um, allows you to create not only good service, but operationally tight services. And then the other thing that, like, glares out about DevOps is the pipeline concept. Right, and this is the 2000, I think, six. This always amazes me. 2006, Dan North, uh, Chris Reed, and Jez Humble gave this presentation. And people, uh, no pictures of it, yeah, okay. Normally, like, 15 pictures of this, and it's, it was actually introduced in 2006. But it is the concept of, I hate Nassim Taleb, but I'm gonna, I have, sometimes I have to use the word anti-fragility. Um, and the, uh, the, you know, it is, Check box, 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 gate, red, go back. Box, 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 great, go back. Right? And you're just constantly creating this um, resilience through gating. Right? And that's what we do in the pipeline, right? And we shift left. And so um, about four years ago, I saw a Google presentation where they talked about the, all these insane things, right? And uh, the thing that like, knocked me off my socks is the 75 million tests runs daily. And two years ago, and I would say whatever Google's presenting, they're telling you something they did two years ago. Now, that's my theory. Uh, so, um, so about two years ago, they said, oh, no, John, you're wrong. We're actually doing 150 million automated tests today. It's something you call the end on cord, and I'm going to steal time about how Toyota operates, but Toyota loves when end on cord is like stop the line. They cherish when those numbers go up. Western culture is more like numbers go down. So. The, the idea is that the more resilience and the more times things are breaking, the stronger and better you're getting. And um, Google is, say you want, they're the mecca of um, infrastructure. And so in summary on this shortest DevOps, maybe it wasn't the shortest, but we'll know. Um, Agile took us months to days to deliver software. So I, I skipped the kind of Agile history, right? And then DevOps came along. We're like, oh, we're so awesome. We're going to fix all of that. And we took months and days to deploy software, right? So we, we got to a point where, you know, Agile was basically handing off developers. And they're like, I wish you would have told us about this thing. And then, you know, so we got that. We're, we're pretty awesome, right? And I forgot my hat. But then now is the point where I just slam my hat on the floor and say, God damn it. But we forgot to include security. Like the same mistake that we thought we were so glorious about, myself included, I'm making fun of myself, was like, holy shit. Um, one other side thing is um, Shannon Leitz, if you don't follow her, you should. I'm sorry, my shit is cutting off there, but um, she, she goes on to DevSecOps. So at RSA um, this year, just I, like a few weeks ago, um, she was going around, we had a DevSecOps track, and she was asking people who are very savvy security people, what's your favorite metrics? for um, security or DevSecOps, depending on the conversation. And a lot of people were like, you know, ah, oh, shit, I don't know. And, and more savvy ones said, like, de uh, defect density, like how many um, security defects or 7172 per 10,000 lines of code or something like that, am I decreasing that? And she never got the answer that she really wanted, which was adversary return rate, like, which is, or, re or adversary retention, which is, well, she's on another planet, but she's right. Um, she, she runs a 40-person red team at Intuit. Uh, but she says that, like, like, what we have to get really better is understanding who our adversaries are. And so her, one of her favorite metrics is if the really bad guys are coming to your site and they're going away or they're only coming in once a month to check, that means that you're not a high target value for them. Your, the ROI of, of reaching you is too high. And, and I believe she's right that this is one of the best metrics. Now, there's a little bit of work. And in fact, um, a shout out to Signal Sciences. She'll tell you that that is kind of an instrumental tool in, in helping her get to this point where she can identify adversaries. There's a lot of other things she does. But there's a little bit of work in figuring out who an adversary is. It's not trivial. But once you get there, now you can start like actually knowing 
who they are. So we, we're not doing any of that shit. She's on an island screaming for the last three years. And now people are actually starting to listen, and I'm her prophet. Like the best message you take away from my presentation is go watch every one of her videos. And I'm not kidding. So she has this thing about recognizing your adversaries and their motivations. Um, you know, the, um, you know, you start from the left, there are, there are good guys, bad guys, there's scanners, there's some people scan to sell information about your sites, um, there are researchers, good guys, bad guys. I got to interview Chris Roberts at RSA, which was awesome, he's the guy that actually hacked into a running plane and, and, and r drove the, the uh, climb <laughs> instruction. And I talked to him about that, and he's like, they're white hackers. He's like, he's like, I do this, and I throw grenades, I get arrested, but, and fair warning, it's broke, you figure it out. So he's bad guy, good guy. I mean, really, he's a good guy. But he doesn't give a shit about, like, oh, my God, you shouldn't have told the world this. But, like, if he doesn't tell the world this, the bad people know it, and all the good people don't. Um, you go right, uh, there are paid noise, right, people like DOD, uh, um, you know, they basically attack, but the really, really dangerous people, and in fact, one of the ones that's popping up as kind of the most notorious version of the red adversaries, are they're getting in your system and they're selling crypto mining, right? I mean, literally, that's the big game now where people are making millions of dollars finding hidden pockets. Um, so I won't tell who, but somebody told me a story just the other day or yesterday about they found a, um, a, a, a de delivery pipeline and basically embedded himself in a bunch of workers. Talk about sneaky. They're always running. They're always kind of busy. They were actually selling crypto mining to other people. Um, in fact, um, Derek Weiss pointed this out to me. Um, this was just out in May 2nd. Like, this is insane, right? It's a mass miner, of course, mass scan. It does basically a high-performance TCP scan of IPv4 address in less than five minutes. And it's, it's really nice because it will actually inject into struts to a WannaCry and put the crypto mining in there for you. Oh, they're so nice. Oh, those guys. So here's a question where I ask about adversaries. How many people work for a bank or a financial institution? Not that, okay, enough. How many of you like meet once a month to talk about common adversaries and, and um, these people that are attacking you and sharing knowledge about all this? One. All right, we'll talk to you later. Um, usually the answer is none. And here's the thing, right? The adversaries are doing that. Look, you want to get a definition of DevOps. Look, you want to talk about collaboration. They're really good at collaborating on how to get into your systems. Like, we suck. I mean, that, that answer, like, uh, what, 10 people raised their hand in financial institutions, probably all in Austin. And, and this is what Shannon says. Like, you know, we need to get better as our community. Hopefully DevSecOps will drive that. So I started thinking about this, you build it, you secure it. Right? A, a meme on, um, like, okay, we, we made a mistake. We forgot secure. And some people didn't, but most did. We forgot security, we were beating our chest about how awesome we were for DevOps, and like, oh shit, why didn't we do the same thing with security? And so, like, DevSecOps really to me, you know, I, I said this yesterday, somebody asked me the definition of DevOps, he said, you ask 10 people DevOps, they'll give you 10 answers. But here's the kicker, the, all the answers are correct, right? Because we don't have a definition of DevOps, so that's, that's the thing that's great about DevOps, and that's the thing that sucks about DevOps. But here's the thing, so you'll see there's no doubt there'll be 10 answers and 10 right answers in two, three, five years from now on DevSecOps. But I'll give you mine anyway. <laughs> um, which is, I think, the perimeters are, we need, to get to, we need to flip the narrative so developers can own security. So we need to create our security people to get involved in that collaborative effort to give them the meta automation, the guardrails, um, the policy, everything they knew. And don't just tell them to go out to OWASP and go read the fucking manual. Sorry, one F-bomb. Um, the, uh, like, like, no, no, that's how DevOps kind of happened. When people ask dumb questions, we didn't shoo them away. We said, come on, come on, I want to understand why you asked that dumb question. Right? Um, and uh, so, like, that's the first order primitive. Um, and then, you know, again, I think that we, we, we start, we clearly have to adapt the shift left supply chain. How can we automate everything in the supply chain as an abstraction on top of all the other things we do for security? Um, and here's the other thing, too, um, before we get to this, is that I asked the woman at Fannie Mae, why do you think that breach took so long at Equifax? 
And she said, uh, Citroen Lago, she said, I think what it is is that um, in security, a lot of organizations have this sense that they spend money with the vendors, the sales reps come in, the suit and ties who sell the big iron stuff, and they feel safe. The throat to choke, all that. And the reality is they're now all of a sudden not safe. And the truth was, pre-DevOps, that was the mentality of most organizations where if I did a deal with IBM or HP, I had one throat to choke, I was safe, they gave me a whole suite of how to do this. And what DevOps actually transformed the narrative of, I call it, from a push from the vendor to a, well, actually, uh, yeah, push from the vendors to us to a pull from the vendors to us. Like, we decided that, you know what, no one vendor is going to protect us. Or the, the people get this. I have to own my own SLA or whatever, and I have to figure out how to protect my, and it may be your, and not your, but your, uh, your proprietary solution here, it may be some scripts here, it may be an open source project here, but I am gonna pull in what I need to protect my system. And her point was, it looked like security, people were in this pre-DevOps mode for security. And so the second, I think, primitive of DevSecOps is, it's a bend in the way we think about who owns security. Is it some you know, um, $10 million a year contract with a couple of vendors? Or is it an AppSec team that makes sure that on uh, March 9th, when Risk tells them, hey, your, um, your uh, true North is like up for grabs right now. How do you do that? And she wrote a curl script that hit thousands and thousands in parallel and it took two days. It sounds simple, but it wasn't, right? No vendor gave them that solution. They didn't wait till Monday to call the vendor to say, hey, you know, we got this $10 million deal for us, and we got this problem here. Is there any way you can fix it? Yeah. Get in line, buddy. So the state of DevSecOps can be illustrated by what I would say this. If, if somebody came to me and said, John, I really want you to come in and see my site, and we like doing so awesome DevOps stuff, and I do this a lot, and I walk in and it looks like this, and I, I, this is no recommend. I picked the th easiest three icons I could find <laughs> um, that were appropriate to the, the, the bucket of the supply chain. I'd say, and I, I would hope a bunch of people are, are virtually scratching their head right now, like, why in the shit don't I have version control built, but they got Selenium and they got Ansible, huh? I'd be like, guys, you're, you know, guys and gals, you got it, like, Something a little wacky here, right? Like, that doesn't look right. It feels wrong. Right? You want, how do you shift left if you don't have all the buckets? Well, the truth is, that's kind of the state of art of security in most places right now. Well, we got something here, you know, we got something there, but, oh, we should put something in version control. Wow, hmm, I hadn't thought about that. So all I'm saying, DevSecOps, is like, get the freaking memo. I said freaking that time. Um, and uh, fill in all the boxes. And get the security people to help you fill in the boxes. Get the security people to help you figure out what... The, the, your best security people like say, please, developer, never go to the OWASP site. Please, don't go there. I beg of you. It's not written for you. You will get lost. It'll be dangerous waters, right? Because you're not a security person, and they speak security. The really smart organizations are writing their own wikis. They're defining their own GitHub repositories with the OWASP 1010 vulnerabilities and the right examples of code. So the developer's like, oh, I just got this red. It links me to the repository that has the sample code of how to make it right. It's simple, but it's hard, right? Uh, we did this thing for um, a, a government agency, which was, you know, the, this is the soup, the nuts, you know, um, a regulated environment, you know. I mean, this is, you know, when it starts looking like this on top of your supply chain, right? And mileage varies, but I mean, the, th the, the truth of the matter is, like, this is what, you know, hopefully DevSecOps will look like kind of everywhere or in a high majority of places that at least use the banner of DevOps. And Gartner has a nice little um, report. It's getting cut off, but you do Gartner, DevSecOps, you'll find it. And they do a nice little matrix of like what things should happen. And you know, again, I'll let you to go read that report. Uh, it's you know, no disrespect to uh, Gartner people, but normally Gartner is full of shit, um, except when you need to use them in a PowerPoint presentation. Then they're awesome. Um, but uh, <laughs> but but the point is, there are some people there to get it right. We got Chris Little's there now. He's not here, is he? 
He's a local uh, Austin guy, and he's awesome, and he's now a Gartner. Uh, Cameron Haight has always been an amazing guy. So, you know, as much as I make fun of Gartner, there are some really awesome people there. And this one, they got it right. So what I'm saying is the Goldilocks zone is the supply chain. Um, you think about things that you can be doing. Maybe um, even that back at story creation, think about the security and the technical data of security. Um, put in, um, you know, security um, uh, plugins in your IntelliJ or Eclipse that can try to catch things real early. Um, there are open source and there are proprieties that will actually continually scan your, your source code repository, trying to find known vulnerabilities. Um, and then, of course, in your build, right, you know, like you definitely, table stakes is library or app, app, app level vulnerability scanning, great. Um, the, uh, my friend is the bad guy. <laughs> no, it's some guy, I'm like, you, it's not five minutes, buddy. But I can't yell at him because I love this guy. Um, the, um, the um, I don't make sense a lot, too, so I'll just say that. But um, Veracode, and, you know, again, there are things as you go to the right. Um, if I had more time, I'd tell you about the real danger of cloud is less about libraries and more about configuration definitions. That's the new danger zone. All the cut and paste stack exchange examples of anything where from a, uh, an open-ended security group to a, I don't know, this works, I don't know what that shit does, but it works. VPC definitions that you found on Stack, stack Overflow to, um, to, God forbid, some of the Kubernetes and Helm uh, configurations I've seen lately. Um, you know, uh, like progress, we gotta move fast. But these configure YAML, I mean, YAML is all over the place. We are being infected, invested by YAML. Stop. Um, like, we just gotta be really clear about like those as first primitive artifacts that need to be managed just like everything. They should be in source control, everything. Security groups, definitions in source control. VPCs, um, you need to create a mindset of a culture where the, the security people are part of the team. And it's not a throw they over the wall. They get engaged, they're happy, they wanna put their meta in there. They want you to do better. They want you to ask stupid questions. You know, um, and, you know in the DevOps Handbook, actually Gene wrote this chapter. Um, we, you know, it was, uh, it was a, you know, kind of early in the discussion of security. Gene did a great job. But, like, you know, trained developers to, to develop secure code, right? Uh, security issue. You know, a bug is a bug is a bug is a bug. I think that's another James, James Wicket um, quote. Right, like stop thinking about like these kind of bugs go here and these kind of bugs go in Jira. Like a security defect is a bug, it's a software bug, right? Um, you know, um, control tools, I mean all the things I already told you, he just does a nice way of, of describing it in a chapter. Um, shift left, right again, the whole notion of if I could do this. All right, so I need to actually get to the divine, I might steal a minute. So why I name this presentation? How many people have read Bill Bryson? Oh, fair amount, right? So he's a travel writer, very funny, very informative. He's written a lot of books, but one of the books he wrote was Walk in the Woods. You probably heard that. But he also wrote one like the uh, Short History of Everything, which is a travel writer's guide to all of science. It's really, really cool, funny. But there was a thing in here that he said that I've just always remembered as one of my favorite quotes in any book where he's talking about at the time that Newton was basically finishing Procipia, which was basically redefining everything that mankind would know at that point, you know, a pretty important thing that was going on. Um, there were two sailors somewhere in the South Indies or something shooting the last two dodo birds for fun. The last two dodo birds on the planet were being shot and killed just for fun. In fact, it, you know, he kind of jokes that dodo birds are like, no hit me, no hit me. Um, you know, that's why they call them dodo birds, right? But, uh, um, but he said here, you would be hard pressed, I would submit, to find a better pairing cards to illustrate the divine and felonious nature of the human being. And it's not that dramatic, but we always say culture, 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 culture. I say it a lot. I believe it's right. So literally, I'm at a Chicago cyber conference, about two minutes, I promise. A cyber conference. Uh, in Chicago. And I'm the afternoon keynote, and there's basically um, a hacker. They had him in an a, 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 a undisclosed room. His voice changed everything. And he's, the, uh, he's the, um, basically the experiences of a hacker. Looked like he's about 25 years old. I would guess he probably makes a half a million dollars a year, something, maybe more. And he gave five examples of kill chains, or hacks that he did. So he says, you know, he goes out into the dark web. 
He finds juicy deals for companies where they say, I would like, you know, a million records from this company. He says, well, that one sounds good. He goes, visits the headquarters, hangs out in the coffee shop, figures out how you dress. Sometimes RFID clones your badge. But here's the thing, he was laughing at us. He said, you know, you idiot. he didn't say idiots, but like he was being reasonably respectful, but he was basically saying idiots. He says, you guys have all this stuff about security and all that. You know, the four of the five, left five breaches I did, somebody held the door open for me to get in a building. And he said, you know, so again, like this, the felonious nature of security. And, and, like, and what he didn't understand is there's this idea of the, um, the it was the Diane Vaughn, um, the, help me, the um, normalization of deviance. Right, um, and, and what he didn't understand is when you work for a company for 10, 12 years, right, like you kind of get to the point where you're tired of getting yelled at for not holding the door for the guy that you don't really know, but he's like four, four um, cubes down, and you never talk to him except when he yells at you for not holding the door open. So at some point you just give in, right? And I said, so, but well he didn't get that, and so I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to change my presentation, I'm going to call it the divine and felonious nature, and, and I'm going to tell this story of the thing he didn't know, and he's right, and we are felonious, but what, um, actually, I'm going to end on this. What I thought about is, okay, we could do this FSEGOPS. We could put stuff in the supply chain. We could change the mentality. We could take the security people, get them devops -y, um, call it FSEGOPS, call it DevOps. I don't give a shit. Um, but, like, we'll really win when it's cold and it's raining and Susie's got ten boxes and, <laughs> accidental, she's pregnant. Like, I'm really going deep here. <laughs> Mary, sorry. No, um, and she's like three paces behind you. And you're like, fuck it, door closed. And the door closes. And you wait because you're, you're a gentleman and you're going to help carry the boxes, but you got to wait until she badges it. And you wait there, just get ready to get pounded. And she goes up to you with a finger and she says, I want to thank you because you just made our environment safer. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, but it's like... Like, you know, our CEOs can all day long scream and holler about, we got to do this, and here's the poster. But when that transaction happens on a regular basis, you solve 70% of your problems. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, listening to me this morning.